Loving God, you are our light and our salvation. We are surrounded with so much noise and so many voices clamoring for our attention. We long to hear the voice that speaks words that we can hear nowhere else. We long to hear your voice. And so we pray by your spirit you would speak and you would open our hearts that we may hear and obey. In the name and for the glory of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. I serve at St. Lawrence, Reading. Uh, Reading is a town of around 200,000, located around 45 miles west of London. Although the building has changed through the generations, it is 824 years old, built in 1196. Uh, We spend lots of time in the building imagining how things have changed in those 824 years. I did remind people when the heating broke at Christmas that heating was a fairly new invention for the church. (laughs) But I wonder this especially. I wonder what it is that Christianity offers now that is distinct. When a church like St. Lawrence was built, and for centuries... The church offered things that couldn't be found anywhere else. It was the place of meeting, it was a place of gathering, it was a place of learning, of reading, and of hearing. It was a place of beauty. Most music, nearly all art, had as its theme, God. It was a place of explanation and understanding, a place of connecting with God, deep points of connection giving people a sense of something outside of themselves, something mysterious, something you could say numinous. But as time wore on, do you see that the things, that if the church was the place that once was the only place that offered those things, that people now can find those things in numerous different places, they think. And so we are, if you could say, in a crowded market. Stefan Pass, who is a professor of church planting, uh, says that in, a post, in post-Christendom, the biggest question for the church is to ask, what is distinctive about the gospel? What's the news of Jesus Christ to this generation that we are called to? And of course, the first great gift of the gospel is that we're not left to work that out on our own. The one in whose name we gather, whose life, death, and resurrection are the only things that give any explanation to our life together. The one whose presence is the only thing that makes sense of us. This God has done everything to inform the distinctiveness of this good news. And he does this primarily not by giving us a task in the gospel reading, but by telling us about our identity. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Let your breath be taken away by the reach of it. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is just after the Beatitudes. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, a handful, maybe two handfuls of people. Not just the light of Galilee, not just the light of Jerusalem, not just the light of Israel, but the light of the cosmos. In Jesus' typical way, he gives blessings before he gives commands. Not, no, he doesn't say you should be the light of the world. You could be the light of the world. You ought to be the salt of the earth. Do you see? No, no coulds, no shoulds, no oughts. You are. Church here in Florida, church here in Reading, everything we do try and do in the Anglican communion, in every church, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. 
Here's my only point. Let us become who we are. Not who we ought to be, but who we are. Because Jesus has stated that we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Let us become that. Notice when Jesus says you, he's not talking to an individual. He's talking to a group and to a community. It's a corporate thing. And this is our experience, isn't it? Any of us who minister in any way know that the corporate is the thing that counts. We know we have got in all sorts of trouble when we're getting stuck on our own ministries. We know it's about us. It's we before me. At St. Lawrence, we were given this mandate to see non-church young people come to faith and to build new forms of church with them and basically just handed the keys and then the authorities ran off or kind of walked. And so we were wondering about how we were going to go about doing this. Uh, Belinda and I, I'm married to Belinda, who's by far the best thing about me. Um, we'd arrived in Reading, we didn't know anyone. And uh, we were wondering, how on earth do we do this? Uh, we knew that we might need some other adults later on. Um, my children were the only children in the church for the first three or four years. Uh, we, might, we knew we needed some other people, but I thought what we needed other people, like peers to Belinda and I, we were the oldest in the church by 10 years when we started. I was 31. <laughs> it's true. And um, we knew we needed some more people, but I thought we'd just need those people to pay for things. <laughs> I, I thought we'd just need kind of adults with proper jobs to... Um, to give us money, uh, to serve on the PCC, the vestry, as you call it, to, you know, to be the treasurer. Uh, and so I was like, oh, yeah, I'm sure we're going to need lots of um, people as part of this community. But really, all the work really is done because we were spending all our time outside the church building, uh, something I, I still believe is absolutely essential for any of our work, uh, to make primary contact with people outside of our church buildings. But what I realized, once that we'd reordered the building and once that young people had started coming along, is that the community weren't apart from the mission of what we were trying to do. Because what we were inviting these young people from numerous, numerous backgrounds to do is we were inviting them to belong to the family of God. You see, the community of faith aren't apart from the mission aren't apart from the things that we do. And if you're a minister, and if you spend lots of time outside the building as an evangelist, you'll know that the community aren't apart from that. They're not just paying for it or doing all the administration for it. No, what we are is we are a community because we are the light of the world. The church is what it is because of God. And because this God is who this God is, we have to be for the world. Otherwise, we get God wrong. Because God is for the world. It belongs to our existence. Do you see, it's not a could, it's not a should, it's not an ought to be the light of the world. It is you are. And so the church of the Jesus Christ is for the world. The church only makes sense when we are for the world. And it's so easy to let this slip. It's so easy to be concentrated with our own life, with our own health, with our own flourishing, with our own structures, with our own ways, with our own problems. But as Martin Luther said, the definition of sin is a heart curved in on itself. Is the definition of a sinful church, a church that is curved in on itself. Part of this is what we do to ourselves in church, at living this a kind of life where we think that what we do is the most important thing. 
working for the Archbishop of Canterbury, it's very, very easy to believe that because of the way people treat him and the things that people do, like repaint whole church buildings when he's going to walk through the door. <laughs> I try and tell these people that he is entirely oblivious to the smell of new paint. <laughs> and so we went to Google. Um, as the person who is in charge of Justin's diary at various points, I take him to places and set up meetings for him in places um, around London that he can go and speak about being a Christian and be asked questions. So I took him to Google because I've got a great friend who works there. And we arrived at Google. Now, usually when I arrive somewhere with the Archbishop of Canterbury, there are at least five people waiting for us. The church wardens have got their staffs out. All that stuff always happens. We arrived at Google, and there was no one. <laughs> we went to the front desk, and they said to Justin, what's your name? <laughs> he said, my name's Justin Welby. They said, what's your occupation? <laughs> he says, I work for the Church of England. <laughs> and they said, Great. Well, here's your badge. They printed his badge, and on his badge, it said, Justin Wallaby. <laughs> now, the great thing about Justin is he doesn't care about that. In fact, he's rather um, grateful for it. But do you see that in this world, that, that of course, <laughs> it's not known. I was on the plane yesterday, and... Uh, it might just be the people that I follow on Twitter, but there was an all sorts of Twitter storm amongst the clergy of the Church of England because a photograph had been posted of some clergy in the Netflix series The Crown who were wearing the robes the wrong way round. <laughs> it was causing absolute mayhem. Now... Really? <laughs> is, is this what we're for? In the, congregational of, in the congregation of cardinals, the day before the conclave started, the man who became Pope Francis simply said this. In Revelation chapter 3, we have a picture of Jesus knocking on the door, asking to come in. I wonder if he's knocking on the door of the church, asking to be let out. <laughs> you are the salt of the earth. Salt wasn't in Jesus' time a take it or leave it kind of thing. It wasn't some kind of optional table condiment like ketchup. Well, ketchup isn't that optional in my family, I'm afraid. <laughs> It is with me, but, but do you see, when we hear Jesus say salt of the earth, we go, oh, that's a nice picture. Oh, you know, just a little bit of salt on there. No, no, no. Salt was essential to daily life. It stopped things decaying. It stopped infection spreading. In those days, over a cesspit, you would, once it was full, you'd put salt so it stopped the infections from their spreading. It sanctified people, Leviticus tells us. Salt doesn't exist for itself. Do you see that salt could be one centimeter away from the food that it's supposed to be on, and it makes no difference at all? It only has purpose when it has contact. As the salt of the earth, we have to have contact with this world. In Colossians, St. Paul tells us that that contact is going to be through words. Our conversation is the seasoning. Evangelism is about words. And these words, of course, have to make sense with our lives. Otherwise, as Reinhold Niebuhr says, why do most Christians look like those celebrities who are endorsing products you know they're not using themselves? Our words, of course, must be borne witness by our lives and our life together. Young people tell me all the time, 
that they understand what forgiveness and grace mean by the way they are treated in the community. Of course, the church is the hermeneutic of the gospel. But words are important, and it's important, as St. Paul says, that our words are gracious. The proclaiming of the distinct news of Jesus Christ is our calling. This is the unique gift of the gospel, proclaiming the one that people won't know about unless they're told. The warning is, we can lose our saltiness. What does this look like? Okay, Harvey. Harvey is a 17-year-old white British male. He was kicked out of school at 14 and has a bit of criminality in his background. He is at the Reading Football Academy. By football, I mean the, the game you play when you kick the ball with your foot. Uh, uh, he's got OCD, some spectrum of autism. Harvey is a person who has become a Christian in the last year. He uh, is uh, particularly um, somebody who has always, well, since I've known him, had the view that as a white British male, he's in a minority and he's the most persecuted minority in the country. He is vociferous in his desire for freedom of speech. He is very fond of controversial politicians. He is suspicious of anything that tells him what to do. And so here's this young man who actually is fairly extreme in lots of ways, who has found in Jesus Christ a cause, someone to give his life for. What does, his, what does being the salt of the earth mean for Harvey? He has since brought nine of his friends to faith who come along to St. Lawrence, all boys who play for the Reading Football Academy. What does it mean that we're the salt of the earth for Harvey? This is where we need to work it out. Secularization is the process of the church losing its saltiness. The gospel challenges everything. And so what is our distinctive? It can't be, as Bonhoeffer said, that we can't go for a God of the gaps thing. That we just use God to explain the bits that nothing else can explain. Because those bits are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. No, he says, let's talk about the God of the whole life. How does salt not lose its saltiness? But what if it, the first distinctive is that we are the church and therefore we are for the world? You see, the world isn't, isn't for anyone except itself. The world is just full of groups who are just for themselves. What if the first distinctiveness is the church is this community of people called by Jesus Christ to be for others? The church begins by being salt, by showing the world a different way, precisely because our primary concern isn't our survival or self-preservation. Because mission evangelism isn't about survival and self-preservation. It is about the redeemer of the world. One thing, uh, way I wonder whether we could lose our saltiness is around our covering of the light, which Jesus talks about next. This is fascinating. You are the light of the world. Hold on, Jesus. We thought you were the light of the world. He is the light of the world. It's a rich vein, this light theme. The Torah is the light. The temple is the light. Jerusalem is the light. Israel is the light. Jesus is the light. Now the actual light of the world tells his followers, you are the light of the world. So we need to talk about Jesus. Jesus is our light. In him, there is no darkness. He is the one who has come into darkness that we might see. He has recreated us by speaking his word into us and brought us into being. He has dispelled the darkness and he has changed our lives. And he did this by defeating darkness and he destroyed darkness 
by allowing darkness to do its worst to him, seeming to triumph over him. And there he shone brightest. There he shone most truly. There he shone most beautifully. This is Jesus. We need to talk about Jesus. He is our light. And we are only lights in as much as we orientate ourselves around him. Darkness is alien to him, and therefore darkness must be alien to the community of the light. We must, with great courage and relentlessness, root out darkness from our community, and we must start with ourselves. He is named the light, he is called the light, to bring others to the light. Bringing the light to others is not some exercise in repeating slogans or catchphrases or principles. It is not about calling out the light in other people. It is about Jesus Christ being their light. It doesn't just happen. The lamp doesn't just get put on the lampstand. It is intentional and it is deliberate. One of our very simple strategies in the Church of England is to invite and to ask and to hold every church in the Church of England to doing something that people who don't know about Jesus might hear about him with the intention that they can give their lives to become his followers. We're not even telling people what to do. We just say, do something so people hear the good news and can respond. Show them Jesus. And this is because we are the Church of Jesus Christ, our central commitment. My Bishop Stephen Cottrell, who is Bishop of Chelmsford, going to be Archbishop of York, said this. He received a letter from a church in his diocese telling him that he was very interested in all his talk of evangelism, but they just needed a few years <laughs> because they had to raise enough money for the organ and then they had to put a new carpet in the vestibule. But probably in about five years' time, they thought they could get round to some evangelism. He went to that church the next day. He said, if you'd sent me a letter telling me that you decided as a church of Jesus Christ not to do, gather for worship any longer, but you'd get round to it in probably about five years, he said, you'd expect me to be round now. Why do you think evangelism is any different? You see, because we are the light of the world, this is what we do. We show the light. We must be who we are. Be who you are. Not who you ought to be. Not who you could be. Not who you should be. But be who you are. Be the light of the world and let his light shine. And that needs to be seen all over. Archbishop Justin has got this phrase that he says, Budgets are simply theology written in figures. If you looked at the budget of my church church that I serve, would you see that our primary calling is to be a light to young people by the way we spend our money? If other people looked at your budgets, what would they say were clearly your priorities? And we do this again, not to guarantee our survival or our future, but that those in darkness may turn and see the light and may glorify the Father in heaven so that they too may become witnesses to this light. Our task is to live this out, to lead the church we're called to serve by being who we are. But being committed to this doesn't come without hardship. Our readings today testify to this. Being called light and salt, given to this community. Jesus says this after he's told them they're going to be persecuted. Our readings tell of tears, weeping, reproach, derision, the convictual sense of the burden that Jeremiah has that I want, I don't want to do this, but I have to do it because it's burning within me. And so, some of you might have skipped here for this convention. Some of you may have hauled yourself here, coming out of obedience rather than desire. Some of you may be feeling the cost of it all. 
In praying, I wondered if some of you have particularly felt the cost in your own families. The cost especially in terms of your children. I wondered if some of you gave your children names when they were born because those names signified something to you and you've yet to see those names fulfilled in your children. I wondered whether the Lord wanted to encourage you that the words that you spoke over your children as they were born will come true in his time. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. I have an elder daughter called Hope, who's 18, who hasn't come to church for four years. And yet we believe that the light and the beauty of Jesus Christ will be the thing that captures her heart. But we know, don't we, we know the cost of this. So we take heart. We know that we're tempted on all sides to lower the distinctiveness of the salt, to put a bowl over the light. If that is you or the church that you serve and minister at, take heart. The good news, firstly, is for you. You and we are the ones that Jesus Christ came for, the ones he calls in his grace and goodness, not because we get it right. You're not called the light of the world, the salt of the earth, because we're completely guaranteed to never mess it up, but because God is good and he uses people like us to show his strength. And he constantly calls you if you listen. Can you hear him call again? It's not based on you and your competency, based on his grace and his mercy and his relentless, strong, unflinching love for you, that he would shine on your darkness. He knows. He knows how hard it is and how hard it has been. He sees your sacrifice and your efforts, the attempts and the failures. But he says, you are the salt of of the earth. You are the light of the world. Be who I declare you to be. Be who I called you to be. And so in a moment, we come to the table of Jesus, gathering round him to eat his food. And our open hands and our thirsty souls are the only thing he requires at this point. For it's at our greatest point of need that the uniqueness of the gospel truly impacts us. And because his word always takes flesh, he doesn't simply say, be who you are to us. But in gifts of bread and wine, he comes to live his life within us. So we might be who he declares us to be.